Hello Saints. Today I want to talk about walking worthy of royalty. Or at least how to go find out how to do that. And what got me on this, thinking about this, was, uh, was reading in the book of Samuel. A little, little mention of a verse I don't believe I've ever heard preached on before. But it's in 1 Samuel chapter 10 verses 23 through 25 and I'll read it to you. It says, so they ran and brought him from there. And when he, oh, let me, let me tell you what this is about first and then I'll start over. Saul is about to be anointed the first king of Israel. And they're trying to find him. And Samuel's the prophet that's going to do this, that's going to anoint, that God told Samuel to anoint Saul to be the king of Israel. So here's the story. First Samuel chapter 10 verses 23 through 25 says, so they ran and brought him from there. That would be Saul because he was hiding. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the other people from his shoulders upward. He was a tall person. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? That there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. And this here is what I want you to focus on. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. This little known verse about how to behave in the presence of royalty comes right after Saul is announced and anointed the first king of Israel. Immediately, Samuel teaches, notice, teaches the people, not teaches Saul, Though, you know, throughout their interactions with each other, he taught Saul a lot. But in this particular instance, Samuel is teaching the people the behavior of royalty. In other words, another way to say this is that Samuel is teaching them how to behave in the presence of royalty. There are no details of this teaching, only that Samuel wrote these instructions down in a book, and that book has been lost to history. That said, I want to now want to uh, pivot over to the book of Ephesians. I call it the book of royalty. The gospel of God, the book of royalty is my two names for this book. So the book of Ephesians is a royalty book. That teaches us about the royalty of the Father and the Son. And how to behave in the presence of royalty. The first three chapters explain royalty to us. And how royalty saved us. And made us a part of their kingdom. And the last three chapters teach us how to live and behave in the presence of royalty. Paul starts off in the first verse of the fourth chapter in Ephesians like this. Paul's talking, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Paul shows us that we are continually in the presence of God, in the presence of royalty, when he says in Acts 17.28, Paul's talking to a bunch of philosophers in Athens, uh, and he says, he's talking about God, in him we live and move and have our being. So we are always in the presence of God. And Paul is saying, walk worthy of the calling, which Paul began to show in chapter 1 of Ephesians. This calling has everything to do with royalty, as I will attempt to show here. In Ephesians 1.18, it says this. Paul's, Paul's praying here, and he's asking God for something. He says, that we would have that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened, that we may know what is the hope to which He has called you. That would be God has called you, and what the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. What Paul is asking the Father for is that our new hearts would be able to understand His glory in what Paul calls the Father's inheritance in the saints. It is to this calling Paul is saying, "Walk worthy." Ephesians uh, 4 1 again, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So let's take a look. What is God's inheritance in the saints? It has something to do with this calling 
So we want to look and see what is his inheritance in the saints. First, let's define what saints are. Paul addresses the letter of Ephesians to the saints. Very first verse of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. In Paul's terminology, saints, which is his prefer preferred way to address the children of God, saints means holy one. And Paul uses the word saints to address what we call Christians. He never used the word Christian, which means to be followers of Christ, uh, to, to define God's children. He used the word saint. He used the word saints, plural, 39 times, and he used the word saint once to name what we call Christians. Saints simply means, the definition of saints is holy ones. So we're holy Christians, saints are holy, not because of anything inherently good about themselves, but because the blood of Jesus and the gospel of God made it so, made us so. So what is God's inheritance in the holy ones, right? That calling had to do something to do with his inheritance in the holy ones. And we're going to get to that. Well, I'm trying to I'm going to try and funnel it down to that. So, so here's some questions we're going to ask. What is God's inheritance in the saints? Why is this important? What does it have to do with walking worthy of royalty? And what does God's calling have to do with the inheritance in the saints? As with most or all things that pertain to God, there is no single answer that can define God's calling and or inheritance in the saints. If you look at chapter 2 in Ephesians, you will see all sorts of callings. You will see a calling from death to life, a calling from being on the outside of God's kingdom to being placed on the inside of God's kingdom. There is a calling from hostility towards God to peace with God. There is a calling from exclusion from God to have an access to God. All of these callings are found in Christ. If Jesus has placed you into his body, as shown in Ephesians 2.15, where it says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, those two being Jew and Gentile, and thus making peace. So we see here that Jesus took the Jew and the Gentile and created in himself, in his body, one new man. So, so then all the callings you see in Ephesians chapter 2 apply to you if you've been placed into the body of Christ. So nailing down what the calling of God is will probably expand every time we think we have nailed it down to something we could put in a box and put on the shelf for future use. However, I believe both Paul and Peter make it pretty clear what the foundation and what the bricks of God's calling and inheritance in the saints are. So let's take a look. Paul reveals something really incredible about God's plan of redemption for his people and what that becomes in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And I'll read it to you. So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom, in Jesus, the whole building, Jew and Gentile, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also, that being the Gentiles, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Did you, see, did you catch that? We are being built, as illust illustrated here, as a temple for God to dwell in as a group, as a body, as a church. We are the household of God now, right? Isn't that what it said? It said uh, we are... Now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So we are of the household of God now. And God has taken up residence in us already through 
Jesus Christ. For Scripture says in Galatians 2.20, For I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. So, yeah, there's a residence that God has taken up in Christ in us. But on that day, when all of creation is gathered together in Christ, as shown in Ephesians 1 and elsewhere, and Christ turns over the kingdom to God, uh, you'll see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, it says, Then comes the end, when He, that being Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. At this moment, this temple becomes realized. The temple we just talked about. That we are being built together for a dwelling place. We are being built as a temple together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So on that day, when all of creation is gathered together in Christ, and Christ turns over the kingdom of God, that temple becomes realized. And the dwelling place of God is taken to a whole other plane of existence. We are being built in Jesus Christ, listen to this, as an inheritance for God the Father, His temple, and His dwelling place. Did you catch that? We are being built. In Jesus Christ as an inheritance for God the Father, His temple, and His dwelling place. So does this shed any light on, on possibly on what Jesus may have meant when He said, In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms depending on the translation? We are God's inheritance because we are going to be the building that is collectively made up of bricks or I'm going to show it a little bit stones. Or in this case, what I just read, the rooms or mansions in our Father's house. God's inheritance. There, there's this house, and we're part of that building, that temple. Peter says it like this, and this is in 1 Peter 2.5. He says, you also, as living stones, could use bricks or rooms by what we just were looked at. Uh, you also, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, this is a picture of the saints and holy ones becoming or being God's inheritance and possession. Did you get that? We are also living stones being built, ongoing, up into a spiritual house. On that day when Jesus delivers the kingdom over to God, that spiritual house, that temple, God's inheritance becomes fully realized at that moment. So hopefully this sheds some light on walking worthy of royalty and seeing that we are being prepared to be the temple, spiritual house, dwelling place, and the inheritance for His majesty and our Father on that great day. We don't have Samuel, Samuel's book that teaches us how to behave in the presence of royalty. That book's been lost to history. But we do have a book that teaches us, now this book only applies to God's children, how to behave in His Majesty's presence, how to come in and go out before Him, because we always are in whom we live and move and have our being. That book of instruction for the regenerate people that is, people who are made new creation of Christ, is the Bible. In this video, we look mostly at one book of the Bible, the book of Ephesians, the book of royalty. I encourage you to study the last three chapters of Ephesians so you will know how to rightly behave in the presence of royalty. But I exhort you to get introduced to royalty properly in the first three chapters of Ephesians. May the Lord bless you keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And Lord, I ask, Lord, that we be given a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you and that you would let us see your glory and let us see your royalty and help us to know how to go out and come in before you, Lord. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.